Hi everyone, I'm Lynn, a type designer, technologist, and educator. Today I'm very excited to talk about type's relationship to technology and the potential that it holds for us. But before we come to present day, let's talk about the historical context first. It's never been a huge secret that type has always been influenced by the technology available at the time, and thus the crafting tool. Here's an example of proto syntaic script, considered the earliest trace of our Latin alphabet. And you can imagine that the tools available at the time were a sharp piece of rock, if you can call that technology. And as time passes on and we invent more different kinds of writing surfaces, more different kinds of writing tools, and invent conventions of writing, style starts to evolve and we start to see different kinds of letter forms start to emerge. And I'm going to be skipping over a lot of time, of course, um, but I'm just trying to give you a brief idea about the development of technology and how the letter form forms are changing to adapt to it. So here we see Anshul, uh, which now has a broad nibbed influence. And eventually in time, we develop technology that allows us to reproduce information in mass with movable type. So this is Jikji, the oldest example of metal movable type that uh, was invented in Korea. So here we see uh, the idea of writing with a pointed brush still there, uh, but it's getting reproduced into this format where we can print um, uh, these uh, forms over and over again a lot faster than how a scribe can transcribe one by one. And here is the famous Gutenberg Bible, uh, the oldest uh, printed book in Europe. And we can imagine that uh, it's not just the letter forms that are coming about. Uh, we have different kinds of paper. We have different kinds of material that people can use for type. And uh, from here, we start to see uh, type evolving a little bit more um, away from like strict writing. And uh, we'll talk about that. So at first, you could imagine that movable types would be trying to emulate writing directly because that's the only reference that type designers have. So here we see example of fractal calligraphy on the left and type made with that as inspiration on the right. And you can see how similar it is. It looks remarkably similar, uh, minus some delicate points that uh, metal type back in those days cannot reproduce. So you could imagine that uh, metal type because uh, they needed to be printed uh, with some kind of pressure over and over, they would probably want to reduce the amount of delicate parts on that type so it doesn't break after um, however many runs of printing. And after a time, um, we start to see the departure of type from the the literal pen. So here we can see Romain de Roy from... Uh, the 17th century, the King's Roman. So this typeface is um, said to be said to have been designed by a committee and embraces uh, so-called rational principles, as you can see by the uh, the geometry that is shown on top of this G right here. And you can imagine with anything uh, completely geometric, the hand and pen can't quite reproduce that. Um, so we see this departure and of course, sometimes this departure away from like the, the pen, um, you know, straight out of like human hands goes a little bit too far off, like such as fat faces. Right. Uh, but, but here we see the, uh, the people of this time trying to go to the extremes for the sake of style rather than pure limitations of technology. At this time, it's probably driven by culture. So here we can see uh, the so-called fat faces, which are probably getting used so people would pay attention as they were going by on the street, like, you know, to catch people's eyes for the sake of ad advertisement. But oftentimes, technology did play a critical role in changing the shapes and styles of letters. So if you um, remember from just a few minutes ago how movable type was designed so it could print well on paper um, and save its form in the process, you can imagine that when the concept of the screen comes about, it changes a lot of things. So if you can imagine a physical printing process, there's ink, 
there's um, like metal bits of type, right? Um, and uh, the ink and all these factors. So if you can imagine that as um, like a unit of technology that is being used to create um, type and then all the way to the screen, which, you know, the screen is very, very different from um, ink and paper and all these different things, right? So you can imagine a lot of things would also change. So here we see an example of uh, the the ASCII, the Ataski type for Atari on the upper left. So here we see how the type has been designed so it optimizes for the screen, which was a very low pixel resolution at the time. And so instead of type being concerned with little bits of delicate metal bits, we see type being concerned with how less pixels it can use um, to fit in a certain amount of screen space. And this is taken to the extreme for uh, specialized uh, bits of technology, such as a microwave screen or uh, the seven segment display, as it's called. You see numerals here and not quite um, letters, but you can imagine that with the invention of a seven, seven, seven segment display, um, people would have had to rethink what letter what these numerals should look like so instead of a three that is round they probably had to think of a three that has all these straight segments um, and you have probably seen variations of this for things such as the outside of trains or uh, signs um, that are a little bit older than uh, you know, like new modern you know, retina screens or something like that. And you can imagine uh, there are other things happening as well, such as this stencil lettering over here. I can imagine that when someone wanted to put down a, uh, some type on the side of a big shipping box, they didn't want to bother with um, some very expensive methods of printing. So they took uh, stencils and then you know spray painted or like painted something on there and you can imagine that because they were making stencils they needed to ensure that the letter form counters it and pop out so you can see this eight is connected by um you know like a bar that goes all the way uh from top to bottom and there we finally get to the digital letter form now that digital writing tools are becoming more and more common place, um, it's getting easier to make our own tools as well. And I want to talk a little bit about how, what the digital form means um, to us as creatives and designers and uh, what this may mean for the new letter shapes that may emerge in our um, you know, contemporary times. And as type nerds, we probably definitely know that type is a visual system, right? So we think about type as a cohesive system where uh, everything looks similar from um, the zero digit to like, you know, like the, the nine digits and punctuations and so forth. We expect them to all look visually cohesive. And if you're more of a type nerd, such as being a type designer, you probably also know that type is a modular system. So it's almost like little Lego bricks that you are uh, forming together. Um, in order to create this visual system. So for instance, you can imagine that if you have a capital letter E, you can probably sort of repurpose and modify those parts to make a capital letter F, right? Um, and if you are more of a nerd, uh, you will probably also know that it is an instructional system underneath. You have probably realized if you're in any sort of font designing um, program that it tells you which coordinates any uh, point is on. So if you're drawing a certain letter, you might have seen little um, digits that tell you this is on the coordinate 100 by 100. And then like the next one is on like, I don't know, like negative 10 and a zero or, you know, something um, to that effect. We'll um, talk more about that in a second. But it's a nested layer of systems. And I think this is very interesting about digital type because Unlike uh, the technology that came before us, we can now access the instructional part of this system. And uh, for teaching computers how to draw letters, I just wanted to put, uh, plug in this quick quote by uh, Donald Knuth uh, from The Concept of a Metaphone. And here he discusses how machines don't quite understand letters like 
uh, like you and I might understand letters. We have the concept of a letter form um, as a small child. Like we have the concept that a, an A is an A, and we know that the lowercase a is has a relationship to the uppercase A because we sort of um, instinctively know it because we have this like common uh, language uh, that we speak um, and write. And computers don't have that. They have zero context about, about what letters are. Like for to them, it's completely foreign. And it's almost as if tr you're trying to describe attributes of an idea to someone who has no idea of what, about what this is. For example, um, we probably have an idea of what an elephant is, right? Like we have the idea, even if you've never seen elephants before, we have this idea of an, a mammal. Um, we have this idea of an animal that has four legs. We have this idea of like what a nose is. And when we imagine like, oh, it has a long nose, we kind of imagine like, well, I have a nose and, you know, maybe it's like a longer version of this nose and it's on like this animal, uh, right? So <laughs> um, imagine the frustration as if the other side has no idea about what it is. And this is almost like trying to teach computers how to draw this letter A. So you can imagine that uh, a computer has a very different context of what an A is. We can't just like make gestures in the air about like A's, like it's like this shape. Um, and it, that doesn't mean anything to a computer because um, it doesn't have that uh, accrued contextual knowledge about what this A is. We have to figure out different ways of telling it what an A is. We can say, hey, it's a raster image and it's like a series of these um, on and off pieces of matrix data, or you can say, hey, it's like the thing that's encoded in the um, the Unicode point 65, or we could say, hey, it's a series of these coordinates, and if you draw these coordinates, um, you get the letter A, right? So <laughs> let's take on the, let's uh, dive a little bit deeper into the coordinate idea. And this is how you know, Bezier curves are drawn. If you're used to drawing Bezier curves in a font drawing program or um, Adobe Illustrator and so forth. So if you unpack the vector form, we can see that a digital form is just a series of instructions, like a cooking recipe. You can imagine that a cooking recipe would tell you that, you know, one, go boil the water, two, uh, measure out like a cup full of pastas and then like three like go put it in the water or you know something like that so it's almost as if it's that except it's a it's a series of coordinates mapped on a plane so when we're telling the computer how to draw this letter a um uh we're telling it that you start from this point one and then you go to the second point and then you go to the third point and then uh, you know when you get to the last point you close the shape um, and so this is what we're describing, what the form looks like when we're um, telling the computer how to draw this letter A. And of course, if you're using a font on a computer, it happens in like such a short amount of time, you would not even notice time had passed, right? Like when you press the letter A on your keyboard, the keyboard knows that like this key that you press for the A is uh, means code point 65, um, you know, Unicode or whatever. And then like it goes to, um, uh, you know, another part of the computer that knows that it should grab the thing that's encoded in the code point 65 from a certain font. And then you probably have some sort of screen that's rendering out the font, you know, like those coordinate points onto your screen, right? And this is very, very different from the past where one, we had a physical tool and we were, when we were writing and we're, we were creating little bits of metal type and, you know, printing it on physical pieces of paper. It's very, very different. And what does this mean for designers who would like to explore this space, like this possibilities of the design space? And you might know the Nord's Eye Cube as a way of thinking about the design space. And um, perhaps we can sort of try to think about each axis as being influenced by a particular tool. So when we think about um, Herit Nordzai's cube, we think about three axes. We think about the contrast type axes. We think about like the diminishing contrast um, or optical size, some people might call it, and the weight, which is the increasing contrast axis. So we can imagine that 
As for increasing contrast, we can think about this like magical pen nib that is increasing in nib width, right? Like as the axis goes on. And as for the contrast type, uh, we think about expansion like a pointed pen influenced concept and the translation as a broad edge nib. So you can imagine that a pointed nib becoming a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more square, right? Like in like minute little increments. So maybe that's how we can think about the contrast type axis. And as for the dimish, diminishing contrast, perhaps we can think about this as if it's the flexibility of the pen tool itself. Um, if you have done calligraphy before, you'll know that even if the pen nib shape is the same, it can behave very, very differently if it has a different kind of flexibility. So if it's less flexible, it creates less contrast, um, it, well, more uniform um, you know, forms. And then if it's more flexible, it has more of a possibility to have you know, thick and thin strokes. So we can think about the axes in terms of physical attributes, if that makes it easier um, to think in our heads. And at least it does for me because I come from a calligraphy background. And while we're in this realm of thinking about um, the design space as in like how it relates to the physical tool, let's also think about, you know, the, the other parts of a tool. So we know that rationally a certain kind of shape creates a certain kind of mark but often there's a lot of surprises that happen when you're using actual physical tools um certain some pens might have a different kind of handle that make you grip it in a certain way that makes a difference when you're writing some paper might be more smoother than others some ink might be more viscous or watery than others um some types of metal might be more malleable and uh, yeah so where am i going with this right you might be wondering and um, I just wanted to point out that the idea of a tool is sometimes different from the actual um, experience of working with the tool. It's like sometimes physical materials misbehave, like this ink splatter that I got when I was using too much ink. I was probably writing this out over and over and it was probably like the 10th time. And at the time I was really disappointed because I was like, oh, like it looks so good, but ink splatter, I'm gonna have to start all over again. But then, I looked at it again and this was actually the most interesting one. And I think that idea is nice to hold on to when you're creating new tools, especially in the digital realm, because sometimes what you're looking for is something that you might have never even considered as something that you were looking for, if that makes any sense. Um, and sometimes the simplest rules for drawing can spark ideas. And here's a very simple computational brush. And the idea is really simple, like it has an origin point and you can just drag and, um, dr you know, it was a click and drag to create different kinds of marks. And of course, um, the first few drawings might be terrible, but then you start trying to work with the tool. Like, what is it allowing me to do? Uh, what kind of shapes come out of the tool naturally? Because you know, just because we're working along the context of what we already know, you can imagine that, um, you know, I'm just trying to work with the A that I know, but what if this tool wants to make a different kind of A shape? And, you know, why not just let it make that A shape? Uh, here is another computational tool that I built that was a little bit more complex. I was inspired by the concept of Metafont that we were talking about way earlier and Alison Parrish's Besmerizing Library. And here is um, the link if you want to check it out. I wanted to build a tool that would allow me to save the gestures of sketches uh, and be allow, you know, allow me to render out all these different kinds of strokes, almost like a pointed brush that I could reprogram the pressure after the fact. So here uh, you see me, um, you know, like updating the strokes and being like, hey, like it should be. Uh, 10 thickness to start with, and then maybe it goes to a three, and then maybe it goes to a 30, and then a 20 and a 10. So um, if that sounds complicated, all I'm, all I'm doing is co um, considering the pressure of this imaginary pointed pen tool. Yeah, and here you see like all, all kinds of whack things happening, but <laughs> you know, sometimes like the glitch, gl glitchiness is endearing in its own way. And I'm not saying any of these tools are perfect, of course. Um, 
<laughs> but I just love to have fun. Here's a fun one. So with Kevin Ye, my partner, we recently launched a new design studio called Type Space Continuum. And we used our website page to showcase some really fun computational sketches. Now this is live type that is um, being manipulated by the user. So as the cursor goes around, you can see that sometimes it lets you manipulate those uh, Bezier coordinates, as you can see here, you can, you're manipulating those like coordinates saying like, Hey, I want to change what this coordinate looks like. And here we can see, um, the type getting sliced into all these different uh, dimensions and getting, um, skewed. And this is all possible because, um, because the malleability of type, right? So like digital type specifically. So these are just like really fun um, uh, concepts that uh, we've been playing with. And what I'll leave you with is one last experiment that I was doing with machine learning and you know, the idea of autonomous design. I feel like sometimes we get carried away and we're like, why don't, why, why don't we have the computer do everything for, for ourselves, you know? Um, I mean, of course, the glowing promise is that the computer will learn and do things by itself, right? But um, the reality is a little bit more complex. So here are the tools that I use, which is Runway ML, which lets you start out with machine learning with uh, relatively little code. And then the MyFonts API, which allowed me to download like tens of thousands of fonts without actually um, having them on my computer. Um, and I wanted to train a style GAN, uh, again, stands for generative adversarial networks on sans serifs because I thought it'd be easier for the machine to recognize. So I downloaded more than 50,000 images to start with, but, um, as with anything, I had to manually weed out 20,000, um, <laughs> takes a lot of time. I think with machine learning, a lot of what's overlooked is the time that it takes to curate um, these data points, but I still had 36,000 at the end that I could train my computer on. And the original, uh, model was trained on human faces. So you can see that you now have this uncanny valley of images of people faces turning into letters because that's what it started out from. But after that, I trained it on ASH, which was a short word that I wanted to try out. And you can see the A morphing into the ASH. And I know this is like flickering on and off for you. Um, so I'll put a still image here. And you can see that the machine after being fed 36,000 images um, recognizes what A, S and H should look like. But uh, the A is a little bit more uh, shakier because A's are quite different. Like you might have an A that is like more round at the top or sometimes it's, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, sharp little apex and so forth. And sometimes the, the bar um, changes quite a bit, right? As opposed to the H, which is a lot more consistent because H designs don't vary too much. Um, what I took away from the project is that like the machine is very good at recognizing patterns, but um, the more complicated an algorithm gets, the more opaque it becomes as to what you are actually influencing. Right, like what is, where is the concept of the paper, the ink, the tool? Um, that becomes a lot more murkier as things get more complex because unless I'm about to go have like a PhD research on machine learning uh, on top of my um, other pursuits, like it's, it's going to be very difficult for me to actually understand the math behind um, what is happening, the very, very complicated math. Um, and I, I very well understand the data set that I'm giving this algorithm, um, but I kind of didn't like the fact that um, what I was giving it uh, didn't really relate to the output of it in the sense that I didn't really understand what was um, opaque and what I could do to resolve that. <laughs> and I know that was a lot, but thank you so much for um, sticking with me through it all. And, you know, these are always evolving thoughts. I just always wanted to, um, you know, like experiment with things and... Um, all these computational experiments are experiments. I'm always trying out new things. And I don't really know what the paper or pen or ink of today is, but I find it very interesting to see what could be. And I really encourage all of you, if you haven't thought about um, using computational methods, to try it out in your own free time also. Thank you so much. Yeah, hello everyone. Oh, I see. Oh, I see. I see questions. 
Um, okay, so I have a question from Diogo. I hope you're. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Um, thank you. Uh, he says, "Do you use any specific programming language to make the changes and contrasts and things like that? How um, have you been introduced to them?" So I, <laughs> um, I, I don't. Okay, so I guess. I work in a variety of languages, like uh, precisely because like the platforms that I want to use, um, you know, obviously like I'm not creating like open frameworks from scratch or like P5, for example. So like I just have to learn the programming language that's that's specific to the platform that I want to be using. Um, so I, I, I have to say, like, I don't use any specific programming languages, like um, all the things that you've seen were written with different uh, platforms. Um, I think some of them were C++, uh, the, the C++ language um, in open frameworks, and then also um, Python and PyQt5. Like, so PyQt5 is like a platform. Um, and also JavaScript for uh, P5.js. Um, and I think the way that I was introduced to them like has been in little little bits and pieces. So like, I love the coding train on YouTube. Like if you don't, if you are interested, like just go look at the coding train videos. Dan Schiffman is amazing. Um, go through the P5.js tutorial, like hundred percent. I, I love those series. Um, great. And okay. So I'm seeing another question and, um, uh, from Pedro, um, you've mentioned Nordzai's theoretical cube and Muth's metafont implementation. Do you think you can GAN them together? Oh, that's interesting. Um, I haven't thought about that. That's very interesting. I mean, like, it, theoretically, I feel like it would be possible, right? Like, if, you know, so like the, I mean, if I'm to um, condense the metafont <laughs> um, idea, it's like this idea of a skeleton that can, um, span across all different styles. So like theoretically, I suppose like you could um, um, you could apply that to the Nord's IQ because like they're not conflicting methods of creation, right? So yeah, I mean, I mean, so the theoretically it's possible. <laughs> and then you can like navigate like the infinite space of like the, the, the Nord's IQ um, GAN, like I, that's interesting. Uh, it's 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 possible. I, I would just need a lot of images <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> um, thank you, Pedro, for the question. Oh, and thank you, Justin. Um, I, I saw that uh, you uploaded the GitHub repo. Thank you. Um, uh, I think that's it for the questions. Um, sorry, I'm just like trying to like navigate, so I, I'm I'm not like missing anyone. Yeah. Okay, I think that's the end of the questions. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you so much for <laughs> thank you so much for being here, everyone. Um, I I know I saw in the chat like like some of you have been like up for like a really long time. <laughs> um, it's so hard to keep up with things these days. And like um, I don't know if everyone can see, but I can sort of like see the participants. Um, and like I see a lot of familiar um, uh, names. Faces are kind of weird in like a one-way webcam format, but yes. Um, thank you so much, everyone. It's it's been it's been a lot of fun, and I hope to see you in other um, A type I um, little bizabo rooms. <laughs>